Okay, folks, let's get started. Uh, in this video topic, I'm going to talk about the exceptional and disfavored status of strict liability crimes and strict liability elements within crimes. Now, the general rule in American criminal law is that we require a guilty mind to support a criminal conviction, a guilty mind going along with some kind of, of a criminal act. Uh, but there are exceptions in a small class of cases, at least it's small right now. Uh, criminal liability is allowed despite the lack of uh, mens rea, strict liability crimes, or for a single element, a strict liability element. This is a setting where studying the exception tells you something about the rule. So if the rule is mens rea, why do we allow strict liability in some settings? What reasoning do we use to explain the exception? That tells us something about the rule. So let's jump in. We begin with the uh, Supreme Court's most famous discussion of strict liability crimes uh, in Morissette versus the United States. So Joseph Edward Morissette was, during the summer times, he's a fruit stand dealer. Uh, in, the, uh, in the winter, he's a scrap metal uh, dealer. Uh, he goes hunting on some government property, just as lots of people do in this uh, Michigan community. While he's there, he notices there's this scrap of of metal, you know, shell casings. They just seem to be in this heap. They're not stacked up or maintained in any way. And some of them, he notices, are years old. He knows that he can get some money from, for this because he's a scrap metal dealer. So he thinks, well, it cost me some money to come up and do the deer hunting. Uh, maybe I can cover my costs by, uh, by uh, reclaiming this, uh, this scrap metal. And so he brings his truck up there. He gets three tons worth of the uh, casings. Uh, he sells it and uh, ultimately uh, gains $84 for his, uh, for his troubles, but he also gets uh, criminal charges. So he is charged under 18 U.S.C. section 641, and let me read the statutory language here. Uh, it's an offense to knowingly convert to his use or the use of another without authority any government property. Now his claim is, well, yeah, I knew I was taking property, but I didn't think it was anybody's. I thought it was just abandoned. I didn't know it was government property anymore. I thought they were just throwing it away. Uh, but the trial court says, no, that's not a defense. I'm not going to instruct the jury on that because when the statute says knowingly, what it means is that you know that you are taking property that doesn't, that is not currently yours. Uh, but it doesn't relate to the government ownership of that property. You don't have to know anything about government ownership. He's convicted. Uh, he is uh, sentenced to two months in jail and a fine of, let's see, $200. Uh, $200. So what happens to Morissette's case in the Supreme Court? Well, Justice Robert Jackson uh, writes the opinion for the court. He was not only a Supreme Court Justice, but was the chief prosecutor for the Allied Forces for the United States in the Nuremberg War Trials at the end of World War uh, II. So in Jackson's opinion, uh, he addresses the meaning of the statute. This is an exercise in statutory interpretation, trying to understand what that language knowingly means, to what does it attach. Uh, but the court reads this statute, interprets this statute in light of a long history of disfavoring strict liability. So they say, well, it must be that Congress meant that knowingly to apply to the government ownership of the property, uh, because otherwise we would have a strict liability element in this crime, and that would be contrary to a lot of our history and tradition. The court ultimately rules that the, uh, uh, that the conviction can't stand uh, because the crime as interpreted by the judge in the jury instructions uh, was, uh, was invalid. The defendant has to know that the property uh, was belonged to the government. So what's the reasoning of the court here? Why is strict liability disfavored? Uh, well, the court says uh, that uh, this is just a traditional, fundamental part of the criminal law. It's based in a universal belief in the freedom of the human will. If you can't help what you're doing, if we are like Skinner's rats running around a maze box, and we're always driven by external stimuli, not our own choices, then we might not be so concerned about intent in the criminal law. But if we're starting with the presumption of free will and capacity to choose one thing over the other, 
uh, then we blame someone only for that choice, only for the state of mind involved in doing something wrong. The court also links strict liability to a distinctly American idea of individualism. It says that it's uh, that, uh, that the traditional intent requirement of the criminal law uh, promotes individual accountability uh, for things that one can choose, and this links up with the idea of, of uh, intense individualism that is part of the American background. Nevertheless, says the court, strict liability can be used in some exceptional areas. Uh, you could be used in what we call malum prohibitum crimes. Rather than something that everybody knows is, uh, is wrong, it's malum in se, it is wrong in itself, something that is part of, say, the Ten Commandments or other traditional uh, statements of morality. It might be, on the other hand, malum prohibitum. That is, it's wrong only because we prohibit it, only because we say it's wrong. It's not kind of a natural moral intuition to know that, uh, that this is wrong. Uh, so, for instance, the court says, when you get mass market societies and you start, say, distributing food to lots of people, and it, it is malum prohibitum, it is a crime because we prohibit it to, uh, to distribute food that is mislabeled. That may not be one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not mislabel food, uh, but accurate labels are absolutely critical in a world where you have mass distribution, you don't personally know the butcher or the produce guy or whatever. Uh, you have to depend on those labels for the purity of your foods. Uh, the court also says that you might be able to get away with, uh, with strict liability when you've got small penalties, when it's not a big prison term, if you're just talking about fines and maybe small fines at that. But the court says in this case we've got traditional theft, a classic malum in se crime, and we've got uh, a, a statute that can punish someone for, uh, uh, for prison term, as we have a two-month term here. Here, the court says, this is not one of those exceptional areas. Just like the court in Morissette, the model penal code disfavors strict liability. You've got, you've got examples of that scattered all over the code, but there are two listed here. Uh, one of them is in section 2.02, subpart 3, that just says uh, that uh, if a statute in the state code is silent as to culpability, you should assume that it's not strict liability. You should attach at least recklessly as a state of mind to that crime or to that element. Uh, and then more directly in section 2.05, uh, the model penal code says that strict liability is going to be available uh, only for what I'll call fake crimes. Uh, that is what the code calls violations, which are not felonies, they're not misdemeanors, they're something below misdemeanor. And it says you can have strict liability for offenses that are defined by statutes other than the criminal code. So if there's, you know, in the food distribution code of the state, there might be some, uh, you know, some penalties imposed. Maybe it's a crime, maybe it's adjudicated in criminal court, but it's not really a crime. It doesn't work like other crimes. And so you might have strict liability there if the legislature states so clearly. That being said, the model penal code disfavors strict liability. Nevertheless, lots of state legislatures, when they get to the real business of passing statutes, they don't have a problem with it. And the best, the most recurrent example of this is child sex offenses, where very often there is some kind of strict liability element as to either the age of the child or the, the gap in age between the defendant and the child. Uh, as to those elements, very often state legislatures say, we don't care whether you knew or didn't know or had reason to know or not. It's just if the age, is, uh, if the age gap is there or if the child is below the certain you know, designated cutoff age, then this statute applies. So what's to be said on either side of this question, pro-strict liability or anti-strict liability? Uh, well, legislatures that pass these, uh, these strict liability crimes or strict liability elements on the pro side, they say, we're trying to shape behavior. It's a deterrence argument. Uh, it's saying that we're trying to promote uh, knowledge where it doesn't exist. So if you don't know about the age of a person who might be involved in a sexual situation with you, then we want laws that will encourage you to find out. We want to change behavior. Uh, it may be that legislatures also are 
sort of skeptical of the of the uh, accuracy of claims of lack of knowledge. In certain settings, it may just be difficult, maybe uh, unusually difficult for the prosecution to prove a state of mind when, in the legislature's view, you really either know or you just should know in that setting that that element is present. What about over on the over on the con side? What's to be said against strict liability? Well, we've already started talking about this with the Morissette case, uh, but the idea is that much of the criminal law is built around this idea of free will of uh, individuals, of uh, us holding people responsible for their choices, for things that they knew about and went forward with, um, or at least in the negligence context, something that they should have known about, something that it's reasonable for us to expect that somebody would learn about and, uh, and avoid that conduct, something you should have known. But we do have some long-term trends here uh, that may indicate the arrival of uh, more strict liability crimes and strict liability elements. For instance, to the extent that the criminal law is not trying to judge uh, what happened in a given criminal action, but instead is just trying to judge who's dangerous and who should we hold on to, you know, in the predictive dangerousness business, uh, then strict liability is consistent with that function of the criminal law, that incapacitation function of the criminal law that depends on our ability to predict dangerousness. Uh, this is a setting where, right now, strict liability is the exception. If you go down to the courthouse, it's not often the case that you're facing strict liability elements or crimes, uh, but it's probably a growth area and it's an area where the debate tells you something about traditional criminal law assumptions and values. So keep those in mind as we go forward.